where I was going through scripture to confirm the available meanings of the word baptism to particular scriptural passages by trying to discern what the context is and what the best understanding of that word baptism were all the way down to F, C, D, E, F. Hebrews 9.10, they are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, baptismo, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Here we have the noun form of baptismo from the basic noun baptisma, from which we get our word baptism. Here in Hebrews 9.10, the word is used to describe ceremonial washings required by the rituals of Judaism, which describes an item which is immersed beneath water, and then the object was shaken off. <clears throat> this describes a ceremonial washing. So sometimes the interpretation or translation might throw off a little bit. It still means immersion of some kind. Mark 7, 1 to 4. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the, the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Well, washing, if you actually look at the Greek, that is baptismus, another form of, of uh, the, the word used, baptismus, a form of the key noun baptisma, to describe the ceremonial washings of cups and pots and brass vessels and tables. Literally, small, immersible dining couches or pillows. There wasn't a whole big, huge table of six or seven feet long. This involves an immersion into water. And, of course, the word baptisma is used at the ceremony of water baptism. And we compare that with Matthew 3, 7, 3, 16, John 4, 1, Acts 16, 33, 1 Corinthians 1, 14. So on the basis of what we have seen, when the New Testament speaks of the ceremony of water baptism, the word baptism must mean placing into. A person is placed into or introduced into water when he is baptized. And this is all the word means. And that's symbolic. It does not mean sprinkle, and it provides nothing more than an identification and immersion into whatever the context describes. In the case of water baptism, the identification and immersion is water and water alone. The symbolic significance, however, is one of recognizing that one has already been identified with Jesus Christ in an actual manner and what he did on the cross. The dipping... Oops, the dipping into, the placing into, is to identify one object with another so that a relationship has been changed from its original state. So when the word baptizo, to baptize, is used, it signifies that one thing is so identified with another that the nature of the character of the former is changed. So when it's rather uh, not logical, like baptism in water, you're not identified or you haven't become water. So uh, then we look for the context to determine what the symbolic uh, meaning is for the actual action. For example, Jesus Christ was baptized in water to symbolize his baptism on the cross for sins. We look to the cross for that. It is also identified in water for the mission that he was to do, which was be baptized into sin, dying on the cross for the sins of the whole world. It's two ways the same, the same thing. So Dr. John Danish says, here is a thing A, and here is a thing B. Thing B has a character as B, but B is identified with A in such a way that the result is AB, a totally different character than that which is originally was. B is identified with A, that B is no longer as it once was. Its character or position or quality has been changed in some way so that it is now AB. It is a different thing. We're talking about actual baptisms reality. Symbolic of that, now the word baptism may symbolize a real change that has already taken place, or it may symbolize something that is going to take place. <clears throat> from the classical usage, and from the usage of the language of the Greek New Testament, as it was used on the streets of the New Testament world, which we call Koine, or the common Greek language, the basic concepts, concept 
of baptized is to immerse, identify identification as a result of immersing. So in, the, in other words, we have B being immersed into A, so that the result is something totally different, A, B, a combination. Now we have the seven major baptisms in the Bible, keeping this in mind of the definition we just looked at. In Scripture, there are seven major baptisms which fall into two different kinds. Four dry, which are real, and real identifications are real changes, and three wet, which are symbolic of an actual event which has already taken or will take place. So we have the baptism of Moses. 1 Corinthians 10, 1-3 For I, Paul, do not want you, fellow Jews, to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers, our ancestors, and Jews who lived in the Exodus generation when they escaped out of Egypt, were all under the cloud. Under the cloud, that, that phrase, the cloud which led them to freedom from Egypt, and then through the wilderness as a guide by day, Exodus 13, 21. This cloud that was present at the Red Sea, when the Exodus generation of Jews came to the shore of that sea and were going to cross, this cloud was the evidence of the glory of God, of his almighty power. The Jews described this as the Shekinah glory of God in their commentary writings on the Old Testament called Targums. We'll take a look at Exodus 13, 21 to 22. By day, the Lord went ahead of them, the escaping Israelites, in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day and night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. The Jewish people, being identified with the Shekinah glory of God, of Jesus Christ, day and night, night and day. That cloud was a manifestation of the Lord God himself, his visible glory. The Jews called the gods, this God's Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory of God, the manifested glory of God, was identified with God's chosen people, Israel. Take a look at Romans 9, 4. The people of Israel, this is the adoption as sons. There's the divine glory, the Shekinah glory of God, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. So Paul is saying, there's Israel's, is the adoption as sons. There's is the divine glory, the Shekinah glory of God, the covenants, and the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. They're identified with that. We're moving on in 1 Corinthians 10, 1-2. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the Red Sea to freedom. And here's the definition. All and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud in the glory of God and in the sea. Baptized with Moses means that they were identified with Moses in some respect. <clears throat> and all the Jews were baptized into Moses in the cloud in the glory of God and in the sea. So also the Shekinah glory of God they were identified with. Also, all the Jews of the Exodus generation were identified with God, with Moses as God's chosen people and God's chosen man to lead them. Moses and the Exodus generation Jewish people were baptized in the cloud and the sea, identified with God in his manifestation of himself as the cloud, and they were also identified with Moses, leading them through the sea, in the, of, of the Red Sea, in the event of their escaping through it from the Egyptians. Dr. John Danish states it this way, the Jews were identified with the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God, which was present there among them. While passing through the miracle of the Red Sea, they were identified with Moses. <clears throat> in their experience of walking dry shod through that sea and escaping the approaching attacking forces of Pharaoh, the Jews were identified, therefore, with the Shekinah glory of God as our Lord Jesus Christ led them by day, manifesting himself in the cloud, and by night manifesting himself in the pillar of fire. So, verse 2, they were all baptized in Moses in the cloud of the sea, and they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock who was the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, and that rock was Christ. So the baptism of Moses was a baptism that identified the Exodus generation of Jews with Moses with respect to the freedom to which they were being led, and it identified them with the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ in the form of the Shekinah glory cloud, who was their God, and they were his people. And they actually experienced this identification by escaping from the pursuing Egyptians to their freedom on the other side in Arabia and in the, towards the Promised Land. Exodus 6, 6-7. to 7. 
Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you from my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And then I will take you from my people, and I will be your God. Well, for ever since ancient times, the people of Israel have been identified with the one and only creator God of the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God has been identified with them. So that's an apt, actual, experiential baptism. The baptism of the cross, of Christ bearing the sins of the whole world, is the next baptism that's actual. Isaiah 53, 4 to 6. Surely he, Jesus Christ, took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are to be spiritually healed of iniquities of sin, an actual experiential baptism. The sins of the whole world placed upon him, he received that punishment. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have, has turned to his own way. And the Lord God the Father has laid on him, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. Notice the words upon him and has laid on him, indicating an immersing of our Lord into or an identification of our Lord with a baptism in the sins of the whole world. The iniquity of us all, that's what the phrase refers to. Compare 1 John 2, 2. For he is our propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So in 1 Peter 2, 24, And he himself, Jesus Christ, bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to the control of the sin nature, and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were spiritually healed of sin. A lot of people think you're going to be physically healed, but we have physical ailments. They are t sometimes when God heals us and sometimes not. But this particular passage is talking about the wounds on the cross that Jesus received refer to the wound of total forgiveness of our sins when we trust alone in him alone for that propitiation. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him who knew no sin <clears throat> to be sin for us, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. Most of the words to be sin for us which signify an identification of our Lord with the sins of the whole world for us. These verses explain the nature of the baptism of the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ was made sin. Sin was laid upon him by God the Father. He had become immersed in. He had become identified with. And he had been baptized in the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future. The Gospel of Matthew and Mark refer to this baptism specifically. In Mark 10, 35 to 39, <clears throat> also Matthew 20. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let, us, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink from the cup I drink? or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. And Jesus was saying there, Can you indeed suffer on the cross for the sins of the whole world, being totally immersed in the evil of the world for the sake of righteousness? Jesus Christ is about to go to the cross at that time. He is going to become identified with, in other words, baptized with sins of the whole world. He is not talking about water baptism here. He is talking about some kind of baptism which is about to come upon him. And he is asking the disciples, James and John, who are looking for a special place of authority in his kingdom. Are you able to bear this baptism that I'm about to experience? I've heard a number of people say that they want to get water baptized like Jesus was. The answer to them is the same that Jesus gave to James and John. Matthew 26, 39. Going a little farther, hey, Jesus fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And in John 18, 11, Jesus therefore said to Peter, Put the sword into the sheath, the cup, which the Father has given me, I shall I not drink it? The cup in the aforementioned verses refers to the cross, the cup of suffering, the, the cup of being made sin, 
who knew no sin became sin for us. More on this next time.